Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Murphy. Um, thank you all for joining us today. And um, we're going to be continuing our study through Deuteronomy today, specifically Deuteronomy 11. But before we get there, I remember when I first stepped into ministry, I worked under a pastor, and he um, had a, I wouldn't say controversial style of doing introductions, but he worked with youth ministry for a very long time, and he always told a story about poop (laughs) every single time. And his philosophy was, is if you can keep them there with a poop story, they'll stick through everything. (laughs) And so I told myself I would never, ever, ever do that. (laughs) And here I am. (laughs) I'll save you the details on it, but um, for those of you that don't know, I run an organization called Murphy Outback Youth Ministries um, across the street, super hard to miss. But it is an organization that works with the local kids at Hidden Valley and Lincoln Savage. We provide before school um, times for kids to hang out as well as time after school with our Tuesday clubs. Last year we did a karate class. We help out with the high school, some of the organizations up there as well, some coaching. Um, And it's just a really cool opportunity to connect with the community out here in Murphy. Sometimes, and by sometimes I mean every morning before school, I'm there. Um, Tyler was there this year nice and early. And I don't know if you know this about the Murphy community or Grants Pass in general, but we have at times a a homeless situation. Um, And and with that, there's a lot of places that if they can, if there's a place to sleep, they find a place to sleep. And we had a long weekend and we got to the youth center, and one of the kids is like, Adam, I think there's someone out there sleeping behind uh, the ramp over, over at the church. And so we're in the back part of the church building over at Murphy Chapel, um, and the bathrooms are up in the actual church building, just to give you an idea of where we're at. And I thought it was just a p- pile of, we had a bunch of debris, they'd done some projects over there. I didn't think anything of it, and then all of a sudden the pile was was moving. Um, And obviously, my priority over at the youth center is always for the safety of the kids. I have to make sure that they they are taken care of. And it was maybe 6.45, maybe maybe 7 o'clock. I had not drinking my coffee yet. (laughs) And I walk over towards the church building, and there is just this smell. And the smell could only be one thing. Poop. Yes. Human waste. And it was everywhere. On the walls, on the ramp. And I do not do, I have a weak stomach. And you would think, or you would hope that as a believer, my initial response was to be loving, to be gracious, to be caring, but it was not. It was, you need to leave the property now, and I'm going to go get a pressure washer and clean up this mess. The hope would be to be loving, but I was not loving in that circumstance. I'll continue the story on a little bit later. Matthew twenty-two thirty-four 34 through 40. Right after the miracle of water to wine at the wedding, just some really cool stuff that's happened. The Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees. They gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and prophets. And that's our Sunday morning right there. 
That's, that's the message. Love the Lord your God with all your, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That is going to be the conclusion of our sermon today, and now you know. Um, but before we get really into the meat of what we're going to be sharing, I just want to open up in a word of prayer, and then we'll get into Deuteronomy. So Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you that we have the opportunity to, to love in unlovable situations. God, we have the opportunity to, to be led by, by the God who created all things. God, the God who created us with a purpose and with vision. God, I just pray that as we study your word today and as we spend this time in Deuteronomy, Lord, I pray that you just speak to our hearts. God, that we get up and leave and, and we make a difference in our community. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, you are turning to the passage today. If you aren't already there, I want you to think about that commandment. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And a second like it, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. What does it truly look like to love God? And how... Do we truly love our neighbor? So Deuteronomy 11, 1 through 7, is really setting up the foundation for what Moses is sharing with the Israelites. Remember, this has been a long 40-year journey, and Moses is writing to the Israelites, letting them know, hey, I'm not going to be with you, but if you want to pursue God, if you want to continue this healthy relationship with God where he provides and he does all things for you, Listen up. And he says, You shall therefore love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his rules, and his commandments always. And consider today, since I am not speaking to your children who have not known or seen it, consider the discipline of the Lord your God, his greatness, his mighty hand and his outstretched arm, his signs and his deeds that he did in Egypt to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and to all his land. And what he did to the army of Egypt, to their horses and to their chariots, how he made the water of the Red Sea flow over them as they pursued after you, and how the Lord has destroyed them to this day. And what he did for you in the wilderness until you came to this place, and what he did to Dathan and Abram, the sons of Eliab, son of Reuben, how the earth opened his mouth and swallowed them up, and their households, their tents, and every living thing that followed them in the midst of all Israel. For your eyes have seen all the great works of the Lord that he did. Again, Moses setting up the foundation for what he's about to share with the Israelites, reminding them of the journey that they have been on, the journey that God has taken them through despite their rebellion, despite their best efforts to do what they wanted. He's reminding them to look back at the journey God has taken them on since Israel. He brought them out of slavery. He fed them. He nourished them. He provided the resources over and over again. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about how they were on this journey, and it talked about in the passage how their pants didn't even wear, like their clothing didn't even wear, their feet didn't even swell up. Like That's the type of miracles that, like, as someone who loves to hike, I would love to go on a hike and not tear clothing and not to have swollen feet and not to get dehydrated. Like all those things that God provided is so insane to me. So in response, he's encouraging them through Moses, the Israelites, to obey him because he has shown himself faithful. And then in verse 8, it continues to say, You shall therefore keep the whole commandment that I command of you that you may be strong and go in and take possession of the land that you are going over to possess, and that you may live long in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give to them and to their offspring, a land flowing with milk and honey. Again, reminding them to obey the entirety of God's commandment. It continues to talk about how this new land is not like the land of Egypt that they left, And in verse 12, even talking about how God is looking after the land. 
obey the lamb because God has provided you this amazing thing. Remember, this is a promise that happened over 40 years ago, that when they got brought out of Israel or out of Egypt, they're being brought to this land and and Moses just over and over again, like, God did this for you. So listen to what he has to say. It's like when a parent tells their kid to do something because the parent is looking out for the best interest of the kid, like a hot fire. This is probably a conversation every parent has had with their kid at one point or another of that is hot, don't touch it. And the response of the kid is, ooh, it's bright and shiny, let's touch it. It never works out for the kid. At some point, we as children should obey our parents, and yet next time there's a fire, what do we do? We want to touch it. Next time there's something bright and shiny, we want to touch it. And so in 13, verse 13, it says, And if you will indeed obey my commandments that I command you today to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart, with all your soul, he will give the rain for your land in its seasons, the early rain and the later rain, that you may gather in your grain and your wine and your oil. And he will give, you gra- and he will give grass in your field for your livestock, and you shall eat and be full. Take care lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain. And the land will yield no fruit, and you will perish quickly off the good land of the Lord, that the Lord is giving you. So point one is remember what God has done. Point two in this section is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And again, back to point one, remember what God has done. Going on to verse 18, you shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontless, frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you are sitting in your house and when you are walking by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall write them on your doorposts of your house and on your gates that your days and the, the days of your children may be bold, multiplied in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give them, as long as the heavens are above the earth. For if you will be careful to do all this commandment that I command you do, to do, loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and holding fast to him, then the Lord will drive out all these nations before you, and you will dispossess nations greater and mightier than you. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. Your territory shall be from the wilderness to the Lebanon and from the river and the river Euphrates to the Western Sea. No one shall be able to stand against you. The Lord your God will lay the fear of you and the dread of you on all the land that you shall tread as he promised you. So one, remember what God has done. Two, love the Lord your God. Three, meditate on the word of God. Meditate on these things it talks about in that section to continue to pursue and remember what God has done for you. Put it on your doorposts. As you're walking around, meditate on these things. Follow the commandment of the Lord, meditating on his words of the Lord. Moses isn't just throwing this out to remind Israelites to continue to seek out what God has said and done. But he has seen the Israelites, as we have seen over the past couple months, disregard what God has done and what he has said. Even though he's taken them through all of these things, they continue to rebel. Even though God has shown that he is faithful, they continue to question everything he asked them to do. Moses knows from experience that the Israelites are quick to forget. So meditate on his word 
and remember what he has done for you. Because in verse 26, we see that when we do these things, there are both blessings and consequences to how we respond to God. Verse 26, see, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way I am commanding you today, to go after other gods that you have not known. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it, you shall set the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. Are they not beyond the Jordan, west of the road, toward the going down of the sun, in the land of the Canaanites who live in the Arabah, opposite of Gilgal, beside the oak of Morah. For you are to cross over the Jordan to go in and take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And when you possess it and live in it, you shall be careful to do all the statutes and the rules that I am setting before you today. That was a lot. A lot to read, a lot to take in. And what I'm loving about Deuteronomy personally is I have a tendency to overcomplicate scripture. I, I'll read a passage and, and I'll, I'll start to mull it over, try to figure out what it's saying. And, and sometimes scripture is saying exactly what it's saying. There, there's no deeper hidden meaning to it. Moses was telling the Israelites to remember what God had done for them, to love God, to meditate on his word, and that there were going to be consequences depending on if they followed what God had said and loved him or if they decided that they were going to do their own thing. So if the Israelites follow God's call, there will be great blessing over them. And if they don't, there will be a great curse. I wonder what they're going to choose. If you've read Judges, you know. Or anything else in the Old Testament or New Testament. So here we are. The Israelites are about to leave the guidance of Moses, and he is giving them some very basic instruction on how to follow God in this new season of life. Obey God's commandment. Love the Lord their God. Meditate on his word. I'll say this over and over again. There are going to be consequences in how you respond to God's commandments, good or bad. So going back to the Pharisees in Matthew 22, when they ask what the greatest commandment is, we see Jesus reference this passage to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And the second commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. So how... Do we, in response to what God has done for us, follow God's commandments? Well, we must love him by being obedient to him. Not because we have to be obedient, because if we truly love God, we want to do what God has called us to do. We want to do what God has called us to do because we see that when we do that, when God asks us to do something, Just like when a parent tells a kid not to touch the stove, it's in our best interest. It may not always seem like the direct linear path, but God's plan for our lives is going to be better and more impactful for us than anything that we can do for ourselves. We must love him by being obedient. We must meditate on his word. Spend time meditating on the things that he has done for us, reflecting on what God has done for each of us. And if he says the second commandment of this is to love our neighbor, 
loving God, loving our neighbor, and we're being obedient to that. We must not forget what he has done for us, and we must love our neighbors as ourselves. So Luke 10, 25-37, most of you guys have heard this passage. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered. Again, this is this lawyer. Jesus is responding to him like, What does the Bible say? What does my word say in the Old Testament? What does the law say? And he again references this passage. You shall love the Lord your God with your heart and with your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by one, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on olive, on oil and wine, when he sat him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. So who are you in the story? That's the question that, that I often ask myself. I'd like to think that I'm the good Samaritan, the one that steps out to walk alongside the broken. But clearly, in my story at the beginning of the passage, it's a lot easier to say than to do. When you're walking alongside someone so broken and lost for hope to really put yourself out there and take the extra step to make sure they're okay. We should all be the Good Samaritan, but that's a lot harder to do than it is to think about. So my question to you, as you're pursuing what it looks like to love your neighbor, I don't want you to think about those three characters. I want you to think about who is your neighbor. It's, it's a much harder question to answer or answer truthfully. Is it the person with the sketchy background that just moved into your neighborhood? Or... Maybe it's someone living at Riverside Park. Or maybe it's the person at the store that hasn't had a shower in weeks. Or the person that only calls you if they want something from you. Maybe it's your mother-in-law that drives you absolutely crazy. Who is your neighbor? Who is the person that God has called to impact their life? I'm sure you are all thinking of someone. I can think of a handful of them. Are you the good Samaritan or are you the priest walking on the other side of the road waiting for someone else to step in and help? This is just one commandment. There's so many other things that God has called us to. Are you following God's commandments for your life? Do you not only love him, but love his creation and the people that he's put 
before you. Moses then continues to encourage them to meditate on his word. Are you meditating on the word of God? Are you reflecting on the, the moments of your life that God has taken you out of? Sometimes when I look back at my past or I look back at the different situations of my life where God has brought me out of something, I have to look at the people that came alongside me. Brothers and sisters in Christ and family members and friends who, who helped pull me out of dark times or helped give, give me a helping hand when I didn't know how I was going to ne- pay my next rent check. meditating on the things that God has brought you through, or even meditating on the word of God, which shows us that he sent his son to die on the cross so that we could have eternal life. That our life was no longer having to be defined by the hopelessness of our sin, but being defined by the hope that is found in Jesus Christ. When you meditate on those things, when you meditate on what God has truly done for you, It's humbling because Jesus brought himself through absolute betrayal from those that loved him. Be into a point where he was unrecognizable on the cross, not even recognizable as human man on the cross, so that we could have hope and hope eternal. So I ask you, as we pursue what it looks like to live like Moses is encouraging the Israelites, as we pursue living like Christ has called us to live, when was the last time that you meditated on his word? That you spent time set apart to just sit in the word of God and reflect on what God has done for you. Are you paying enough attention to God's call in your life to know if what you are doing is looking at blessings or at consequences? There are a lot of good things to do in the world, but are they the things that God has called you to? God called the Israelites to step into the promised land and to know that he is the great provider. They did step one. And then they lost sight of what God had done for them. Have you lost sight of what God has done for you? Human condition is to try and do it on our own. But when we truly reflect on what God has done for us, we see that we cannot do it on our own. Remember who you were without the hope found in salvation. Meditate on his word. Follow the call that he has placed on your life and be blessed by who he is because God is good, period. God is good. If the worship team wants to come back up, Obey God's commandments. Love the Lord your God. Meditate on his word and remember what he has done for you. And know that when we do that, there is great blessing. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity to just sit in the hope that you have provided for us. God, I pray that as we pursue you and pursue just following what you have called us to do and who to be, God, that I pray we don't lose sight of the hope that you have brought us, the the turmoil that you have brought us out of. God, I just pray that you receive all the glory. Amen.